please welcome Nir Eyal. Thank you very much, Chris, for the opportunity to present this. Um, and uh, I'm really enjoying the discussion so far. With thousands of people dying globally every day from coronavirus and thousands more condemned to death by its disruptions, think about how much in life we could save by adopting testing methods for vaccines that are accelerated. Suppose we could shorten time to roll out by one day or by several months. Here's the conventional way to test the efficacy of vaccines, the, the slowest part of vaccine testing. You distribute the participants to people who get the vaccine versus people who get a control, and then they go back to their homes and you wait. You wait until there are enough exposures out there to the virus to start seeing differences, meaningful differences between these two groups, which might allow you to conclude that the vaccine is much more helpful for preventing infections than the control. But my colleagues, Mark Lipsich, uh, Peter Smith, and myself have proposed what would be potentially a faster method and one that is more immune to the worry that arose recently in a conventional vaccine trial that um, the hotspot will move away before you even reach a statistically meaningful result. Here's what we propose. Uh, it's called a challenge trial. And indeed, as Chris said, uh, what happens after you distribute uh, the vaccine to some people and the control, say the placebo, to others, is you deliberately infect everybody or deliberately expose everybody to the virus. Soon thereafter, you will see results and be able to tell whether the vaccine gives you greater protection uh, than the control um, in terms of, say, infection rates. You're asking yourselves, what's going on here? Uh, this is very risky. Surely uh, I'm a bioethicist. Aren't I concerned people wouldn't die or get very sick uh, in this trial? What, how, how can we justify such a thing? I think that there is a way to justify it ethically because there is a way, among other things, to make the level of risk one that we should agree is tolerable. There will be risks, but they will remain tolerable. What is tolerable risk. Why should there ever be risk in medical practice, medical research? Well, we do tolerate risks in some contexts. Think of kidney donation. Everybody agrees that live kidney donation for the purpose of sustaining the transplantation system is a good thing, although it gains nothing medically for the donor. And there are some risks. The risks are that there is, in a word, a death in one in 3,000 cases of donation. Let's talk about the risk in challenge trials for coronavirus vaccines if they are done in the best possible way. Everybody is, or most everybody is likely to get infected, but in the general population, if you select young people, say people in their 20s for the trial, we can look at the number of um, deaths among people who are in their 20s in the general population, and that number is lower than the deaths from live kidney donation. It is one in 12,000 cases. So by simply focusing on that age group alone in the challenge trial, you're already getting to a tolerable risk level if kidney donation is tolerable, which surely it is. Furthermore, for this trial, we should select people who are not just the average 20 something year old who is competent for rational decision making and fully informed, etc. Also, you should probably, to minimize the risk further, exclude people who have the preconditions that incline people to have severe COVID outcomes, such as death. Once you do that, the number should go, we don't know the number, but it should go seriously below 1 in 12,000. Probability of death upon that infection. And furthermore, I think it would be right to select the participants not um, from the ranks of people who are very unlikely to get infected at any point, but rather people who are in frontline professions, people who reside in big international urban hubs where infection in some future wave, and there will be many waves before we reach herd immunities, in some future wave is 
fairly likely. So they wouldn't move from zero to 100% of infection or near 100%. They would move from something much closer to 100% to 100%. That also further lowers the net added risk from participation. Once you do those things, uh, you get to a level of risk that is far lower than that of kidney donation. In kidney donation, we allow it because it's good for one other person and the donor gives you very fully free and informed consent and autonomously agree to undergo a certain risk for somebody else's sake. The difference is that in this case, we're talking about not just one person aided by this, but potentially many thousand saved from death or from impoverishment. And that is a sort of balance that from a population level bioethics seems to me acceptable. Thank you. Fascinating stuff, Nir. Um, so help me understand this. Like, let's first of all, just look at some of the basic math again. Um, I think currently there's about four or 5,000 people a day dying from coronavirus. That number may plateau down, but it, it's just as likely, I think, to plateau upwards. Um, and um, um, so in a month, that means of the order, uh, 150,000 people might die. And um, so, you know, there's a huge number of lives at stake according to when uh, a vaccine becomes available, right? That's the foundation of, of the argument in many ways. Um, and yet people behave so strangely in ethics around numbers. Um, in the famous trolley car experiments, people will, most people will agree that they would flick a switch that would divert a train onto another track and kill a person if they knew that that would save five people on the other line. But they wouldn't, for example, push a large person over a bridge onto the track to stop the train, even if they knew that would also save lives. There's, that we, we, we differentiate between intentional acts that put individuals at risk. And yet, so this is like a trolley, one of those trolley car experiments, but with on the one hand, saving maybe one or two lives if, if we're unlucky. Um, if we don't do the challenge trials and uh, and potentially sacrificing hundreds of thousands of lives through inaction. I mean, is that one crazy way of, of framing this? The ethics of action versus omission and intention versus mere foreseen effect is very complex. Um, in this case, I believe that there is a strong case for doing it. Just I'll, I'll throw out some pointers about the general context, the trolley problem wouldn't be the same if the person who we are mulling over whether to um, sacrifice for the sake of others would tell us, look, I'm willing to do it. Nor would it be the same if the risk for them because we selected them in the right way is very small indeed. And we know that for some individuals out there, populations at risk, you know, racial minorities, um, older people, people who can't easily avoid um, uh, leaving the workplace, can't really easily avoid the workplace and need to put themselves at risk, etc. For them, the stakes might be higher than for this individual. In this particular case, I would kind of cut to the chase and say, look, look at the analogy of organ transplantation. Look also at the analogy of medical trials that do something very similar. They put healthy people at risk so we can develop drugs and vaccines. For example, the um, safety trials that these vaccines that we are talking about now have already undergone in part, which were done in healthy volunteers who stood nothing to gain from being given this uh, dose of this vaccine. They only stood to gain a certain risk. It was a first in human vaccination. Nobody objected and said, that's immoral, although they put themselves at risk to help all of us with their full consent. They're adults uh, comprehending the risks and there are ways to ensure that. Um, and uh, we accept those things. It's not ideal, but there is no other way to generate vaccines. And I would apply the same to challenge trials. Much of the medical establishment um, is passionately wedded to, the, to this sort of principle, Hippocratic Oath of first do no harm. How would you describe the the ethics of that oath at a time of global emergency? Again, a complex complex issue. 
I, I want to stress two things. First, that the number of people, the dramatic number of people who could be aided by a faster method of testing vaccines matters. And second, that it's not the only argument we mobilize. It's not simply an argument of to, break, to make an omelet, you need to break eggs. Um, the argument is very much respectful of the consent of these individuals, of the ability to, after minimizing the risk by focusing on the lower risk populations and by providing excellent care in the trials, bringing down the risk to an acceptable level. So it's not the case that we are violating the rights of individuals to maximize utility or things of that sort. We're both maximizing utility and respecting rights. And this marriage is very, very compelling in defending uh, the use of these accelerated designs. So uh, we'll take uh, a couple of questions from our community. Can you pop those on screen? Um, so here's one. How would you get people who've been marginalized by medical science and vulnerable groups to participate? How do you cope with and factor in privilege in the process? This is an excellent question. It brings up some complexities because there are things to gain and things to lose from involving more marginalized populations, from um, focusing on, on uh, populations which are more franchised. And here are some of the complexities that I'll throw around uh, some issues. You wanna, you wanna have study participants who are very likely to comprehend the risks very fully. That goes nicely with highly educated um, um, participants. Um, you don't want to exploit people who are participating only because they think that they would get money out of it. My own preference would be not to pay in this trial, but there are other people who think that we should pay, uh, who don't have any alternatives for their care. However, on the other hand, you also want to ensure that constituencies of marginalized populations, of global marginalized populations, can have this claim and say, we participated in this trial, now give us these vaccines, or that we will have tested biologically that this works in different types of uh, human bodies, uh, including uh, not always the bodies of the people who are most enfranchised. So it's a complex balance. Uh, sometimes there is correlation. I mentioned earlier, I think it would be better to test the vaccine in people who otherwise are likely to get infected. Unfortunately, in our very unjust world, that often correlates with prior disadvantage. So is that exploitative, not exploitative? The, fi the exact balance might be something like, try to focus on people who otherwise would probably get infected, but are not the most marginalized while guarding and ensuring the quality of informed consent. It's complex, but these are exactly the kinds of thoughts that we should be having right now. And one more question. How do you prevent or mitigate unnecessary deaths with challenge trials, especially in a fast track setting like this? So first, it's about the selection criteria. You wanna focus on people who are young and otherwise free from risk factors, hypertension, obesity, et cetera, that tend to correlate with bad outcomes from the disease. There is no guarantee that nobody will develop severe COVID, that nobody will die but you can really decrease dramatically the chances that this will happen when you do that. Second, you want in the trial to provide the best medical care available for this disease. By the time this happens, there might be novel therapeutics, they might be scarce. First access to this, I think, in all decency should be in the trials so that uh, we know that in return for this person volunteering to get the trolley or it's actually much less dramatic than that, get the risk of being hit by a trolley, and it's a small risk, I argued. Um, we ensure that we treat them the best way we can, and that's not just, I would propose, knighting them, decorating them, but also giving them the best possible care and engaging them in discussions. They are agents, they're not guinea pigs. Engaging them in the planning of what will happen in these trials. The nonprofit One Day Sooner has, I think, already recruited, I mean, tens of thousands of volunteers willing to participate. Um, is that, how should society re regard this? I mean, at the moment, the, the conversation seems overweighed by 
fear of a death, isn't there another scenario where we basically recognize people willing to do this as, as heroes and celebrate them the same way, you know, we might celebrate someone who was going off to fight a noble war or, you know, do something heroic for mankind, like an astronaut who, who's willing to risk their life to go into space. You know, we celebrate those people. I, I just wonder whether there's any way of actually changing the narrative and whether that would make a difference to accelerating the possibility of these things actually happening. I, I couldn't agree more. I'm, I'm actually in touch with these people and they are, I mean, I'm floored by their courage, by the intelligence, the leadership knows much more about many technical aspects of these trials than I do. They've explored it seriously, academically. Uh, many of them are graduates of the best universities in the world or teachers in the best universities in the world. Um, and um, an amazing combination of, of courage, intelligence, good intentions. And if the volunteers come from these ranks, um, high chance of really comprehending consent. They know what they're getting into. And um, I think every, every ground for the highest honors that our societies have. We'll take uh, one more question and then I'm going to bring back Dr. Kim and David and we'll have a four-way conversation. So let's have the next conversation from our community. It's coming. I tell you what, let's not do that. Let's bring back Dr. Kim and David and uh, just con continue the conversation. Um, because I, I, um, I have a question for Dr. Kim on this as to how, how he views the status. Oh, you know what, uh, the question popped up. With organ donations, which have, we have a long history of knowing the risks based on actual data. Um, how do you figure this out in this novel case before we really know those risks? Thank Great question. We, we, there was a time, by the way, that for organ donation, we allowed it and we didn't know the risks quite yet. Uh, this is the nature of science. Um, there are many unknowns for an emerging infection. I think in this case, we already have the bottom line number. The bottom line number is the biggest risk in these trials is comes from the infection. And we know that if you focus on the relevant age group, we know what in the general population in a developed country with access to critical care, et cetera, that number is roughly, and it's roughly one in 12,000, which I argued is already a tolerable risk level and the number should be below that. There are further unknowns. Sometimes even in that group, people die. Young people sometimes die of this. Healthy young people do. It's very rare, but when they do, we don't know what was exactly responsible. Was it a you know special gene or whatnot? the bottom line risk level for that group is the number that is most pertinent for the decisions about the risk for a group where you do not know what genes people have. We don't know what genes they have that put them at risks here. 